Okay, so we are going to start with the afternoon session. Uh, our, our first speaker doesn't need any presentation, of course, is Professor Rennie Janssen <laughs> from Eindhoven. He's going to talk to us about organic polymer solar cells and multi-junction yeah. solar cells. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica, Julia, and all the other organizers for inviting me here to this uh, nice meeting in Barcelona. Um, and I'm happy to, to uh, give some results that we obtained uh, in, in recent years on, uh, on OPV. Uh, I'll start with a, a slide that all of you know, I guess. Uh, organic photovoltaics consist of two components, donor, acceptor, and you mix them. And then uh, you hope that you get the right morphology that makes a lot of charges, but also allows you to, uh, to extract these charges efficiently. And if you do everything well, then uh, you, of course, hope that uh, uh, you don't lose too much uh, of the incoming sunlight in terms of power, and you can make a reasonable uh, device. If you look at the efficiencies of organic solar cells, they have been increasing over the years. It's a continuously increasing uh, uh, curve. Uh, so you could argue, just wait and then uh, do nothing, and then it will happen by itself. Um, <laughs> To some extent, that is true, because most of these points are, uh, are made by other people. Um, but it's still interesting to, uh, uh, to have a look at it yourself and try to understand uh, how you can further improve these efficiencies. And you can see here that the efficiencies for single junction tandem cells and triple junction solar cells are, uh, are more or less on the same level, around 13% for the best devices that have been published. These are not all certified efficiencies, but more or less numbers that I extracted from, uh, from the literature. Um, I want to take you back to uh, eight years ago when we published this paper. Uh, and at that time, we, um, we made this, uh, this polymer. Uh, and uh, at that time, we were quite happy to have an efficiency of around 5.5%. Uh, it was a kind of low band gap polymer, not completely low band gap, but it has an onset at around uh, 800 nanometers, close to 1.5 EV, and it gave uh, with 70 PCBM an efficiency of 5.5%. And at that time, when I told this at home, and my son said, well, then you lose 94.5%. Uh, uh, so uh, wh where, is that, uh, where is that coming from? Where is these losses? And of course, you can, can kind of think a little bit about uh, where these losses are. I have to remind you that, or I have to, to note that this is a slide that I actually uh, found back in my uh, folders, uh, and it's a slide from 2010. And at that time I said, well, if you look at this device, it gives you 5.5%, it's not very high. And what is really not very good is the external quantum efficiency, that's around 40%. The voltage of this cell compared to the band gap, that loss is uh, still large, 0.7 EV, but for an organic solar cell, that's not so bad. Good organic solar cells get 0.6, and, and the best nowadays get maybe 0.5, but at 0.7 you don't lose that much. And the fill factor of 0.63 is also not optimal, but uh, no, for organic solar cell it's not so bad. So what you look at, at so, so the dream at that time, more or less 2010, was uh, suppose that we can increase this quantum efficiency for the same material to 65%, then we would end up at something like uh, 9%. Now, I'll show you today how, how you do that. It takes eight years. Uh, uh, but uh, um, you, 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 you somehow can get there by, by rational changes. And, and that's what I like to show you, uh, including some, some other things that we have done. So the first uh, thing that is, uh, was at that time already clear is that this is a very complicated scheme. But basically, what it shows is that uh, if you make charges in these systems, then some of these charges recombine into the triplet state on the polymer. And that is a recombination channel that doesn't give you charges that you can collect. And uh, one of the reasons is that this triplet state is, uh, sorry, this triplet state here is below the charge separated state. And you want to have this charge separated high because that gives you a high voltage. And this triplet state is lower. So you kind of compete always against this triplet state on the polymer, which basically is always. Uh, in a good cell below this level, because this level you want to get as close as possible to this level, actually, to the singlet state levels. So you want to have the charge transfer state as close as possible to the absorption edge, because then you lose little energy, but in the triplet state, which typically is 0 0.6, 0 
EV or 0.7 EV below the single estate is always lower, will, will be always a recombination center. And the only way that you can uh, outcompete that is by making charges more, more quickly. And so if, this is, if the kinetics of this process is better than the kinetics of this one, then you uh, have no problems in making these charges. Now the first thing that you can do to improve the efficiency is something very simple, is try to absorb more light. And it's, uh, uh, we've, we collaborated with uh, other people at our university to make a, um, a retrorefractive foil. And it's a foil that, uh, that still helps us now and then uh, to increase the efficiency because it is a foil that when light comes in, uh, it gets re-reflected at the back contact. And uh, this kind of structuring helps to reflect that light back into your cells. So you can increase the efficiency a little bit. Not a lot, but in, in, in cells that do not absorb a lot of light, actually you can make quite a decent improvement. So this is a, a cell where you have the same polymer with the C60 PCBM, then the efficiency is uh, around 4.5%. And if you apply such a foil, then um, especially in the regions where you have little absorption, that is here around 500 nanometers, you can increase the external quantum efficiency just by absorbing more light, and that gives you a somewhat higher current. So such a foil helps as long as the absorption is not too high, because if the absorption, like here, in the, in the real uh, absorption of the polymer is somewhat higher, your increase is less, but there is still an increase, uh, so you, you can uh, profit from it. Uh, in this case, the improvement is around 20%. In practice, it is around, for the best cells, around 5 to 10%, but it helps. The other thing that we realized was that our synthesis was not that great. So if you make these polymers, you typically make uh, donor acceptor polymers in an AB type of polymerization. And uh, we found out that uh, actually you make quite a lot of mistakes, or you make, the, the chemistry makes mistakes, in, in, um, in coupling these, uh, these uh, groups. So sometimes you get couplings like this one, which is a wrong coupling. You basically couple two of these instead of couple this one and this one. And that has to do with the, with the way that you perform the chemistry. Uh, and depending on the catalyst system, you need only small changes, you can actually make a better polymer, a polymer that is almost defect-free. Uh, so here we change the ligand to palladium ratio from 1 to 1 to 1 to 2. And then you get a kind of almost defect-free polymer. And how do we know that? We know that because we deliberately synthesize this wrong coupling element, and we just put it in for 5% and 10% and 20%. And then you can uh, also, you can even put it in for 50%. And if you look at what that, that wrong coupling is on the efficiency, you see a dramatic effect. Or you also see a quite dramatic effect on the absorption spectrum. For 50%, for you get this new absorption, this new, poly basically a new semiconducting polymer. And for a few percent, you get a small increase on this side. Often people say this is aggregation, but in this case it's really not aggregation. It's just a, a, a low band gap segment. That is, this segment is a low band gap segment on the polymer chain. And that actually reduces the current a lot, reduces the quantum efficiency, of course, and reduces in the end the power conversion efficiency. So once you are able to make this polymer virtually defect free, you really gain efficiency. You go from 5.5% already to 7.5%. So you you just made a, a, a very much better polymer. Um, related to that is also the molecular weight. Uh, so the molecular weight of polymers is in general also important for these materials. And that is not, and that is mainly because the polymer, uh, the molecular weight of the polymer has an influence on the morphology. Another thing you can think of is, uh, well, uh, you have this uh, in, in devices, you have this choice of uh, conventional and inverted, and it's kind of interesting that what is called inverted in OPV is called conventional in perovskites. Um, but so this is a, uh, an NIP cell, this is a PIN cell, so to say. And if you uh, make a, uh, the conventional cell, you get to this 7.4. But if you make the same material, the same thing, in a conventional solar, or in the inverted configuration with zinc oxide and molybdenum oxide and silver, you gain another percent. Now then you can ask the question, where is that coming from? Where is this? efficiency coming from. Now, we know where it's not coming from. And the first thing that is not coming from seems to be the morphology. So if you spin code on P-dot or spin code on zinc oxide, I could not tell the difference. And there, it is also, if you analyze these images in more detail, there is no real difference. 
Uh, so we don't have enhanced performance for the inverted device, unlikely due to this change in morphology. Another thing that people have been saying, and that also we've been observing, is this, uh, this paper here, and they, they looked at zinc oxide layers that you make from sol gel. They actually show, after some annealing, they show these nano ripples. Uh, so it's a, a bit of rippled structure, and that um, uh, high difference is around 10 nanometers. The root mean square roughness is a few nanometers. And it has been uh, uh, said that this could enhance light absorption. But we really cannot see this. If we measure the light absorption for a film just on p-dot or on zinc oxide, we see actually that the p-dot film, the optimal p-dot film, which is slightly thicker, I, I should have noticed this actually. So if you look at these conventional inverted cells, then the optimal thickness for a conventional solar cell is somewhat thicker than for an inverted solar cell. I'll come to that later. Uh, but these are real differences and uh, you have to take that into account. So you really have to optimize the thickness for the uh, for the configuration. And if you do this in the 110 nanometers and 90 nanometers, you just see that the p dot film absorbs more light. It's just a thicker film. It absorbs more light. If you do the simulation, the real optical simulation of all the layers in the device, then um, you actually see that uh, the inverted cell at 90 nanometers uh, has somewhat larger, uh, seems to have somewhat larger absorption. And this is um, uh, the same optimization for different thicknesses. This is the curve for the inverted cells. This is the curve for the uh, regular cells. And you see that actually the optimum thickness that you expect is indeed at 19, uh, 90 and 110 nanometers. And that is exactly what, what we find experimentally. You see that the, the integrated current for the 90 nanometers is larger, but if you really look at the number, it's, it's only 0.3 milliamps per square centimeter, whereas experimentally, we find almost two milliamps per square centimeter. So it's, it's not really possible to say that, that the better optical interference that you have in an inverted cell uh, gives you a better, uh, uh, a better current. The difference is larger. Uh, so if you, uh, if you look at the conventional cell 7.3, if you do the inverted cell in the same processing, it's 8.3. And then we optimize a little bit further and uh, we get to, uh, we, we change the co-solvent. And this co-solvent is very important. I, I could talk about an hour for, over the, about the co-solvent, but I will not. What is really important about this co-solvent is you should think of if you, if you evaporate a film, you have a chloroform in this case and a co-solvent. And the chloroform evaporates in 0.7 seconds, it's gone. And then you have a few more seconds in which you basically, your solution is only co-solvent. Uh, for orthodichlorobenzene, 6%, you have three seconds, four seconds, where your solvent is orthodichlorobenzene only. The material doesn't dissolve, so it starts to precipitate, except especially the polymer. And that makes the morphology. And now if you change, um, from orthodichlorobenzene to diphenyl ether. Diphenyl ether is even a worse solvent for the polymer than orthodichlorobenzene is. And the worst solvent, the worst co-solvent, usually gives, in these cases, for these polymers, the highest efficiency. So when we change from orthodichlorobenzene to diphenyl ether, we in indeed come to this 9.6%, and we get to the point that I, I was hoping for eight years ago, that you make a cell which has an efficiency, quantum efficiency, in this case, the maximum is a little bit over 0.7, and you get uh, the same voltage, basically. That hasn't changed. The fill factor has increased a little bit from 0.62 to 0.64, but the main gain is in the, in the current, and especially this is done with such a retroreflective foil. So you can see that when you do the chemistry better, you gain, and when you think about how to make the device better, uh, you can make a gain. <coughs> Market that we still don't know why the inverted cell is better. Uh, it's not the morphology, it's not, it seems not to be the morphology, it seems not to be um, uh, the optical interference, although that is slightly better for the inverted cell, it's not as much better as we see it. So we, we looked in this in more detail and we took also this polymer, this is a related polymer with a thiophene here, ring here instead of a phenyl ring. And for this polymer we had different batches available where we uh, have different molecular weights from, from well, relatively moderate to quite high molecular weight. And you can see here the solutions. This is a solution that, that doesn't uh, gel, 
and this solution completely gels with high molecular weight. And the funny thing now is if you make inverted and regular devices, uh, the difference between regular and uh, inverted completely disappears when you start to get high to high molecular weight. So you see that this is the conventional, it's always worse than the inverted, unless you get to the high molecular weight and then it doesn't matter anymore. And this we've seen for this polymer, but also for a few other materials where the solubility, the low solubility, a low, lower solubility increases the performance, that's one thing. And the second thing is that it decreases the difference between uh, inverted and conventional cells. So this is an observation. We, I, I honestly say we have no explanation. We know a little bit why we get better performance. There is two reasons. One of the reasons is that the morphology gets better. I'll show you that later. And the other reason is uh, uh, the fact that the, that the absorption gets a little bit higher at the higher molecular weight. It was shown by Jenny Nelson a few years ago for the same polymer, I think it was. Uh, the effect that we found is maybe a bit smaller than was reported at that time, but it's a genuine effect that if you have a higher molecular weight, you increase the absorption coefficient, likely because the chains are getting more oriented in the plane of the film. Um, so that is a, a one reason why you increase the current. Uh, the other reason is, is the morphology. Um, so if here's the table, basically showing all the numbers. I will not guide you through all these numbers, but just as molecular weight is increasing, if the molecular weight is increasing, the efficiency is increasing and the difference between the inverted and conventional starts to decrease, basically. And at the highest molecular weights, we don't see a real difference anymore. Uh, this is the graph uh, of, the, of the morphology. If you look at the morphology, this is for the low molecular weight, this is for the highest molecular weight. The differences are small, but if you measure, and this we do with a, a computational method, we just put these images into some kind of software now, and then we can analyze the width of these fibrils that you see, these, these White fibrils are the polymers, and these white fibrils have a certain width. And here the average width is around 60 nanometers, and here it's around 30 nanometers. That depends a little bit on how you measure it, of course, but if you measure it in the same way, you, get, you see that the width is slightly narrower here. Also, if you measure the GWAX, you can see that the, the peak for the pi 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 stacking, that is this one, is, is narrower in the high molecular weight case than in the low molecular weight case. So the narrow fibril width makes, uh, that you should notice that this number is on the order of the exciton diffusion length. So if the width gets larger from here to here, there's a few excitons that will not make it to the interface. And there you, there you start losing current. And together with this lesser absorption, that makes that the current for the low molecular weight cells is less than for the higher molecular weight cells. There's one observation that still does not explain, this still does not explain why there would be a difference between uh, um, invent, uh, inverted and conventional devices for low and high molecular weight. And if you try to analyze that, we were thinking maybe we have in these materials, we have some kind of um, uh, stratification of the concentration uh, so that the uh, uh, inverted and conventional have uh, the same stratification, but uh, maybe with more fullerene at the top and, 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 and more polymer at the bottom. And then it depends on how you put the context, which would be more favorable. Now we try to measure that, and we do see a difference, but it's very small. So this is the low, uh, lower molecular weight. It's not the lowest molecular weight. It's the, the one bit lowest molecular weight, and it's the high molecular weight. And we did uh, depth profiling with uh, XPS, and then you can uh, uh, account for the carbon and zinc and, and nickel, oh sorry, uh, nitrogen and, and sulfur signals. Nitrogen and sulfur is in the polymer, the carbon is in the PCB amide and also in the polymer. And if you uh, do this, you see a small change here. If you take the atom ratio of uh, nitrogen to carbon and sulfur to carbon, you see actually that the polymer concentration for the low molecular weight seems to increase a little bit compared to the material where you have a higher molecular weight. There the increase might also be present, but it's much lower. Um, it's kind of a bit counterintuitive because in this case it means that there would be more polymer at the zinc oxide interface uh, and that would increase the efficiency for the, uh, for the inverted configuration compared to the uh, regular configuration. It's not what you would expect. So whether this is really true or not, it's still a bit of a, 
of a, no, of a question mark, I would, I would guess. But we do see the real differences, reproducible differences between inverted and regular structures. And we have not really been able to pinpoint the real, uh, the real cause of this. Uh, one, uh, the, the, it's not a real morphology difference, and it's not a real optical absorption difference. There must be something else uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, causes this. Now, also for this material, you can make it, and in the end, a quite nice cell. Uh, this is a low band gap cell. Uh, the, the quantum efficiency is a bit less here. You get to, to something like 8% also with a retroreflective foil. And then uh, uh, this is an example again uh, where we show uh, how we can optimize this co solvent for three different polymers, the two ones that I showed in another one, where we optimize this co solvent. And the highest efficiencies are always obtained when the fibril width is the narrowest. Uh, so, kind of uh, try to make the, the polymer morphology, the polymer crystallites, as small as possible then you start to increase the efficiency. And uh, this is for these three materials. We have many more materials where we did this, and for all these DPP, so all DPP type polymers, they all fit more or less on such a line. Uh, it, of course, they're scattered. There's many reasons why efficiencies are low and high. So it's very difficult to make a one-to-one -one relation. But the fibril width is very important. And the, the co-solvent, if you move, move from better co-solvents to worse co-solvents, the efficiency goes up. Um, this is another one. This is another somewhat older paper already uh, where we looked into uh, very low band gap materials where basically the efficiency is lower because the voltage starts to uh, be a real problem for such a cell, but at least you get low efficiency. Now what we uh, intend to do in the end is, uh, is make uh, uh, multi-junction solar cells. So all these things we do actually just to make sure that in the end we can make some kind of a tandem cell or a triple cell. Uh, this is a, a, a quite reasonable triple junction solar cell where we use three different materials. Uh, this material that we developed ourselves is the, the famous PTB7 uh, commercial material and this material we made ourselves but it's inspired on work from uh, from how from uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences in, in Beijing. And uh, these three materials, wide band gap, intermediate band gap, low band gap, are then put into a, a solution processed triple junction solar cells. So all these layers are solution processed. And we developed a new procedure, it's in this paper, for putting a P dot layer onto the polymer layer. The, the, the difficulty, the traditional difficulty with putting P dot on an organic layer is that the P dot is processed from water. And then uh, water does not really uh, like such an organic sol uh, surface, so you get de-wetting and you get all kinds of problems. And there have been many, many people trying to solve this issue by adding uh, all kinds of things. Um, surfactants, uh, taking different solvents, using isopropanol, etc. Now, if you look up the paper, we, the, the, the solution that works at least the best for us is a very simple one. So you, what you do is you add n-propanol, not isopropanol, but n-propanol. And n-propanol, in that, in that more or less in the ratio that we use, has an azeotropous water. Because the most of the alcohols that you, evapor that you add to a water, the aqueous speeded solution, it will first evaporate the, the alcohol, and then it will have water, and that will still do it. But if you take an azeotrope, this, the, 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 the vapor has the same constitution as the, as the liquid. So the, the, the composition doesn't change. And that makes that once you can wet it, it, it will wet entirely during the drying. And that helps a lot. So if you take n-propanol and you mix it in the right amount with the aqueous p you can basically put that layer on any organic layer. Uh, it always works in our hands. Uh, and I hope that it also works in your hands if you try it. Um, so then we put on a zinc oxide layer, zinc oxide nanoparticles, and then you can simply process, or simply, uh, it's not so easy, but uh, uh, you can process these three layers on top of each other. And then you get the uh, um, uh, device performance that's quite nice, around 10% for this triple junction solar cell. And what was especially gratifying to see was this curve. It, it seems like a simple curve. Uh, you just have the EQEs of the three subcells. That seems easy. Um, that is not so easy to measure, actually, because you have to measure such a triple junction cell in such a way that if you want to measure this 
uh, EQE, you have to make sure that the two other cells produce more current, that this is the current limiting cell. So you have to really take care about the bias illumination that you, that you, uh, that you use. Now, nevertheless, you can measure that if you do the right corrections and the right bias illumination. And um, the fact that we think that this is correct is because you see also these thin lines, and these thin lines are not just the fits through the experimental points, but are the calculated <laughs> absorptions. So we know for each layer how much internal quantum efficiency it has. We can calculate with the optical constants in the entire stack what uh, the absorption is. If we multiply the two, we just get the EQE that we would expect. And the thin lines are the EQEs that we expected, and the, uh, the markers are the EQEs that we measured. Now, they are, the fit is, uh, is, uh, was more remarkable than we expected, actually. And there is also the fit between these uh, dots here and the line here. The dots are the experimental, uh, 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 is the experimental IV curve, and the line is the one that we calculated that we would expect to, to get. And in this case, the, uh, the match was perfect. Uh, so this is a, is a nice triple junction solar cell. And then we said, let's, uh, OK, if we can make triples, the next step is four, of course. Uh, uh, so we first, uh, we added, I should show this. This is the uh, interconnection of, uh, of these four cells. You can make a small kind of, yeah, it's, it's not a module. It's just four cells interconnected. But it has more or less the same efficiency. And, and this procedure for these materials works fine. We made, uh, I think in the paper, it shows that we say we make 16 cells and all 16 work. It's not, it's not like that. You have to have, be lucky to, to get it to work. Now, you need a bit of luck for the next thing. Um, is these quadruple cells that I'll show in a minute. This is, there's, there's one issue, huh? there's one issue. If you look at this, you think 10%, yeah. If you look up uh, the good papers, then you will find that people publish 10% with this layer alone. Uh, so what is the gain of, of making a triple junction? Or what is the problem of making a triple junction? The gain is not high, that, but I cannot tell. I use, also, my first graph was that single, triple, and tandem cells more or less have the same efficiency. What is not really the problem? The problem is that in a normal solar, in a single junction solar cell, you basically travel with the light, the active layer, twice. So your absorption is higher, and that makes that the quantum efficiency gets higher. In a, in a tandem cell or a triple junction cell, light that passes this layer has to go a long way to get back, and it will also be absorbed by this layer, and it will also be absorbed by this layer. So the second absorption will not occur. So you, you want to make thicker layers. But all of these organic layers have this problem. That is that the fill factor really decreases a lot with thickness. So the problem of, of making a tandem in a triple junction cell is not so much making the cell, is not so much having the right materials, but having the right materials that allow you to, to keep a high fill factor at high thicknesses. You would like to make 200 or 300 nanometer thick films that absorb all the light for that part of the spectrum and still give you a high fill factor. So that is, that is really a big problem. Now then this quadrupole junction, so we, uh, we had uh, these three, and then we have still have this low band gap polymer that I showed you earlier. So uh, we said, let's, let's try this one. And uh, uh, so this would involve 11 solution process layers, starting from the zinc oxide to this uh, last active layer. Um, now actually, uh, it works. So this is the, uh, the kind of calculation that we put into it. You have a front cell, a front middle cell, a back middle cell, and a back cell. This is the wavelength range where they absorb. You can calculate more or less how many photons are in there. You can calculate from that the current that you would expect for each subcell. That is still at, so the first one would have a lot of current, but the other ones are more or less matched. Then, um, well, this is a kind of yeah, estimate we say, if you absorb only 90% of the light, you get to these once. And then the problem is a bit the internal quantum efficiency. There's not much choice because this lowest, this lowest band gap material has a bit of low quantum efficiency. So the current that you really expect is quite less than for the other ones. It's only 5 milliamps or close to 5 milliamps. And that, that will limit the total performance, of course. So this, this back cell is not the optimal cell uh, for, for... It absorbs up to 1100 nanometers almost, but it doesn't give you the... the yeah, the, the, the current that you would like to have. Still, you can make the cell. So this is the same cell. You get an efficiency that's not very high, 7.5. Uh, but this is the EQE, again, measured for all the layers. Uh, they fit for all the three except for the, 
what we call the middle back cell, that uh, where we had the green line expected and we measured these, uh, these markers. The shape is more or less correct, but the intensity is not. For the other, the intensity is correct and, uh, uh, and actually the shape. So the, these, these glitches that you see here is just optical interference, all these things that you see here. It rather fits nicely, not everywhere, but, but it's, it's uh, still, I find it a remarkable fit for all the assumptions that we have to make. Um, and you see that the, if you integrate these different EQEs, that really the, the back cell is limiting the current of this, uh, of this device. And uh, uh, oh, I see Monica standing up and I'm on my last slide. Uh, so inverted versus regular configuration, sometimes there are significant differences, but the origin is still not completely clear to me. And uh, complex multi-junction solar cells are feasible and we can make up to four layers now. It's actually not that difficult. Uh, uh, but they still suffer from a moderate IQE and a low fill factor for thicker films. If we can solve this, if we can really make thick films, thin, thick organic films that have high fill factors and high EQEs, uh, then uh, such a tandem or triple or, or quadruple, although it is something a bit, a bit funny, of course, uh, 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 will, will, will allow you to make efficiencies to go well over 15%, I assume. That, that should not be a, a problem at all. We will see this in the next year, two years to, happening for sure. Somebody will be able to do this. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people, the, the many people that contributed to it, but the first part of the talk was mainly work from Meng Meng Li and the second was from Dario, uh, postdoc and PhD students who did some excellent work and there were a lot of people that contributed to this. And I'd like to thank them and you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, we have time for one or two questions, probably only one. Jenny? Maybe it'll be short enough to leave room for another. Um, on the inverted cells, René, yeah. did you, can you rule out the effect of doping? Um, because doping we had, you know, we've observed, there have been cases where unintentional doping leads to a difference in performance layer, between mean. back and front. Um, difficult to, uh, we didn't study that in detail, we didn't see any... Sometimes with the thickness dependence of the inverted versus normal you would see a signature. It's, it's the same, so if we, yeah, it's always difficult to measure this exactly, but uh, uh, the fact that, that our optimization really leads to where we expect it to be the, uh, on the optical constants, I think there's not a lot of doping happening here. Um, excluding it is, is something else, of course, that is difficult to say. Uh, in my view, you, you need almost undoped layers to get good, good performance. Uh, so uh, uh, any doping that you would get, we, we, perform, we, we process in the same way, of course, in one case on P dot, in the other case on zinc oxide. It could be, uh, that is one thing that we have tried to prove at some point, but it was difficult. It, it might be uh, because P dot is, of course, a doped layer. Uh, it might be that that dopes the initial part of the polymer layer and that layer, that part of the layer can become inactive then, so to say, and that could reduce the current. That could be an explanation. We've tried to prove that with another material and we wrote a paper, it was never accepted. So and I think this was rightfully never accepted. <laughs> um, uh, um, so I skipped it and, and, and uh, I don't know. It could, could be a reason, yeah. We're going to stop the questions now, please, okay, during the coffee break. Yeah. Let's thank Professor Janssen for a very nice talk. <laughs>